Hello, everybody, and welcome to the ABT Time podcast. Um, sort of restarting here after a mid-year gap. It has been a very, very big, uh, busy year. And this is the 52nd episode. The 51st episode was all the way back in May. We apparently took the whole summer off um, from podcasting. And uh, that's just commentary on how intense everything's been, uh, which is a huge amount of fun. The ABT agenda is booming. In fact, I'm going to start here with some intro comments about where we are with what we're doing with the ABT. And we have two wonderful guests in today's episode, which will be first off, Julie Clausen, who's a longtime member of our group, will join us to talk about uh, things that she's involved with that are ABT related and also the new book a little bit. Then our special guest for the first time ever on the podcast, uh, Naveed Ghaffari, who will talk about our new book on the ABT um, Narrative Gym series that we just released a couple of weeks ago or so. So on that note, let's uh, give a little thought here on where we are with the ABT agenda these days. Uh, this has been a very busy year. Let me just run down the list of <clears throat> rounds of the course that we've done. Um, in this year alone, we've run the course with World Bank, uh, American Fishery Society, U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Forest Service, Counterpart International, a nonprofit for international development projects, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Land Management, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, Global Health Labs in Seattle, and Emory University Medical School was, is the session that we've got going right now. We just finished the uh, GH Labs <clears throat> round, which was round 38 of the course. So we're approaching our 40th round. Actually, if you add in a couple other rounds we've done with other groups, we are at 40 rounds of the course over the cor over the last three years. And that's the, the course itself, the 10 one-hour sessions with the working circles, usually about 25 people in each round of the course. In addition to that, we've come up with a second form of training uh, this year. It kind of arose from some of the groups that say that they, they spend more time in their communication efforts uh, doing verbal communication than written. And that kind of took a while to incubate, but finally came together in a new form that we call the day BT training, day as in daily. And that's where it began actually with uh, one of the folks at Pfizer that we work with had said that he really wanted a form of training that could use with the people there that would be giving them ABT exposure every day, which really kind of plays right into our narrative gym perspective of it, it's like going to the gym. You got to go you know, over and over and over again. It's the repetitive training that starts to build narrative intuition. And on that note, we came up with the day BT idea, which is three weeks in which there's something going on every day um, in all three weeks with the ABT. So what happens is I break everybody into groups of six individuals and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they get queued every morning to just write a one sentence ABT and, and share it with their group of the other five individuals, which can be an ABT on anything. The, the point being is just to activate the narrative part of your brain to be thinking ABT structure and do that for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then on Thursday, we do this really fun thing that we've come up with for this called the ABT hot seat exercise. And that involves um, anywhere from about 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 people. And it's an hour long exercise hosted by myself and Matt, in which Matt, I'm kind of the moderator. Matt is the um, director, I would say. He, <clears throat> he ends up queuing individuals and asking people to, on the spot, give us a one sentence ABT on all kinds of things he prompts you with. They're, the prompts are really funny. So he might ask you to tell us the one sentence ABT of the, the very best automobile you've own, ever owned, or give us the one sentence ABT of a movie you saw recently, or who knows what. And the point of the exercise is to start training people on using the ABT on their feet, because this is what we've heard back from. A lot of people end up in circumstances where they're in a group and someone in the group says, okay, um, in a couple minutes, we're going to ask Matt to give us the rundown of what's going on with his project lately. And suddenly you've been cued and you want to know, you want to understand the ABT well enough that you can just make a few quick notes and two minutes later, deliver the narrative of what's going on with your, your project. 
in ABT structure so that you don't get caught in and, and, and land where you're going on and on and on, everybody's bored, or you don't end up contradicting yourself or confusing people with a whole bunch of different storylines going on at once. You want that simple ABT structure. And so the ABT hot seat is an exercise to help you get that down. And it turns out to be a lot of fun as well. So we're really enjoying doing that. Uh, in fact, we usually announce it to lots of people because it's, it's sort of welcome to anybody listen in. Uh, in fact, we're doing it right now with, um, we'll be doing it with GH Labs during their Thursday lunch session. So it'll just be something we do over lunch and calling on people to give us their ABTs. Um, and then the, on Fridays, we put together a five to seven minute video from our two structuralists, Ayla and Devo. They read over all the ABTs for that week and look for kind of recurring patterns and make about a five to seven minute video of just offering up some notes and tips on ABTs. So it's much lighter, much um, lesser commitment of time, but it's just three weeks of repeated exposure. In fact, what we've been doing with several of the groups is running it immediately after the course. So you finish the 10 one hour sessions, then you go right into the ABT training and it's proving to be very popular. So that's lots of fun. And God, what else have we got going? Well, the, the big thing that's been very draining that actually ate up so much of the summer, and that's why we haven't done any episodes of the podcast, is um, <clears throat> set to work on the sixth version of the Narrative Gym book. This one now is for medicine. And the let's see, we started the Narrative Gym book about two years ago right now. So I wrote the first one coming out of the, that came out of the course, and that was just kind of an introduction to this whole um narrative gym approach to learning abt and then no sooner did i write that one than park howell our business guy looked at it and said nice book but my business people really need to have the abt set into their context their world of business so he and i did a rewrite on that and as soon as that happened doug passon from the law world working with us said the same thing for his people so he and i did a version for law then dave gold i actually recruited um long time Democratic Party strategist, and he and I together wrote the politics version. Um, then Marlis Douglas and Keisha Barr, two biology professors who've been working with us for probably about two and a half years now, they had lots of thoughts on using the ABT with their graduate students and in the world of research science. So the three of us ended up doing the science version of it a year ago right now. And now we are proud to announce the release of the sixth version with the yellow cover, which is the narrative gym for medicine, introducing the ABT framework for medical communication with peers, professionals, and the public. This version has a forward to it written by two doctors who have been our hosts with Emory University Medical School, where the ABT framework course is now an official course within the curriculum there at Emory University and um, doing really well. It's a really great group we've got right now. We're in the middle of that with 18 medical students. Um, so Henry Blumberg and Ego Ofotokan uh, are the two doctors there that originally recruited us to run the course a year ago, and now we're doing it for the second time. And they wrote a foreword to explain how it was they came across the ABT framework and why they felt it was so relevant to their medical program, which is great. And then um, I'll be bringing on Navi Ghaffari in a short while. He is a recent graduate of Harvard University Medical School who contacted me in the spring, we began talking, and now he's part of our group, and we'll talk about that in detail. But for starters, how's about if Julie Clausen now joins me, and we talk a little bit about what's been going on with ABT in your world. Julie, how are you? Where are you coming to us from? I, um, I'm actually currently in Seattle. I was just uh, attending a um, an International Fisheries Congre Congress, so communication is on my mind. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so start us with your, um, well, you you kind of, you joined the course, you were in the first round of the course, um, right? And then out of that, you became part of the team. And then out of that, you made the Climate Ambassadors Program um, happen. So tell us about all that. Yeah. So um, that first course that you that you ran, you know, just really uh, hit me pretty hard as as the challenge to become a better communicator. And I work um, for an NGO. I come from university um, settings, so just 
you know, really was a, a, a big reminder that it is up to us. It is our responsibility to become better communicators. Um, that that's not not going to happen inorganically. It's going to have to. You have to work at it. And so I actually took. You're, you're with the uh, University of Illinois. Great. Yeah, University of Illinois. Yeah. And uh, actually, I took your course twice, which again <laughs> was a um, big reminder that this is a a lifelong journey. Um, every time you take the course, sit in, listen, you learn more and more. There you know, you let, actually- let me let me toss in something right there. We've had two really nice moments um, happen in the past couple months, which is first off, Carrie Kreshek, who's um, kind of head of training for. National Park Service and worked with us for since the beginning of the course has been a huge part of everything. And I had a long talk with her probably a couple of months ago. In the middle of it, she said one really nice thing. She said, you know, the thing that's great about your course is it, it keeps evolving. It keeps changing. And she said, we have a lot of training things we bring in. They're the same thing year after year after year. But with yours, it's always got new people with it, new stuff, and you're, you're evolving the model. That was a really great thing to hear. Um, and then we got the exact same comment last time we were at GH Labs. Last month, we went up there to to kick off the current round of the course, and Matt and um, Devo went with me, and and actually Navid as well. And we had one afternoon some discussions with some of their people, and one of their guys is an absolute superstar, Charles Delahunt, uh, has engaged us in lots of deeply critical discussions of the ABT. He is the head of of AI there, actually, um, machine language programming with uh, Global Health Labs. And he's been a big fan and intrigued with the, the ABT. And then one of the last things he said as he was leaving our discussion that day was um, what same thing. He said, what I really like that you guys are doing is you're evolving this thing and you're listening in these discussions with us, which is nice, given that we bring in Brian Palermo to preach about the importance of listening. It's nice to see <laughs> that we're hopefully embodying that ourselves. And it's very true. And in fact, there's a couple of major things that that Charles had pointed out in the course that we ended up adding to the model. So it's really kind of a, I wouldn't call it crowdsource, but there's a lot of different minds that have been involved from the beginning of 2025, us, including you as a major player on that, that front. Um, and, and you got thoughts on that same thing? Have you, you've seen it now from the beginning. How has the, everything changed? And yeah. Well, I, you know, in fact, it would be, I don't know if you and Matt have ever gone back and, and watched the very, you know, first course, you know, number one, and compared it to what it is now, because it really has evolved. And it's, you know, you're constantly adding or just analyzing or, you know, just putting a new perspective on or, you know, just, um, yeah, really, really exciting. So, um, you know, you really can't watch it enough to, uh, you know, it helps build your intuition, but also bringing in these these new aspects. And, and it does feed on itself because we are constantly thinking this through. Just this morning, we had, um, we now have a weekly uh, usually Monday morning. Today we moved it to Tuesday because of schedule stuff. But it's um, Matt, myself, and then our two structuralists, uh, Ayla and Devo, and they both joined us in January. And they are assigned for every single working circle now. Has one of the two of them overseeing it, and they take notes and then kind of synthesize overall impressions of things. Uh, they put in a lot of effort in this training. And we've had these weekly meetings week after week after week. And this morning we got in this deep discussion of stuff. And I, and I finally just hit a moment where I said, you know, I can't believe we're, we're 10 months into working with this group of the four of us. And the thought processes are more intense right now than they were even at the beginning, rather than anybody getting tired, we're, we keep getting more fired up as we're figuring things out. We're just constantly talking to the, the four of us explaining to each other, I think this is how people are learning this thing. I think how this is how it works. It's just endlessly fascinating. Um, well, say a few words just about the Climate Ambassadors Program then eventually. Yeah, so um, just because I was finding that the, the course and, and as the books came out, the Narrative Gym and, and the whole thing, so usable and practical for what I do. Um, the American Fishery Society was challenging their biologists to go out and talk to, you know, to the public, to the non-scientific public about climate change. The, the current professor was real, or the current president was really making this challenge. And a couple of the biologists came back and they said, we tried, but we actually realized we don't know how to talk to the public in this way. 
Hmm. And so four of us got together and we said, let's put together a training program that we can go over this. And of course, I, I said, I think the, you know, the ABT course is the way to start. Well, then we built this program. It's a two year program. So for two years, we meet monthly and do a training and a working session. But the start of that is the ABT. So they take the ABT course and that serves as the foundation for everything we do, right? So every time we meet, whether we're meeting about audience connections or emotional connections or presentation skills, we do policy engagement, we do media training. The ABT is what is, is runs throughout the whole, the whole two years. And so um, they really see firsthand how this getting your story down, that it's com- concise, what makes it relevant, um, singular problem, and, uh, you know, it just becomes, um, d- you know, just part of, of their communication strategy. That is wonderful. And then we did um, two, two full groups of it. Each time was like 25, 30 people. What was it? Yeah, we do 30, 30 people at a time. Um, and that, that works pretty well. Um, the, whole, the whole program is really built on feedback and, and practice, which is what you promote all the time. You can't be a communicator in a, in a bubble. You, know, you have to have feedback. And, um, and we really build honest feedback, right? So it's not just, oh, good try. It's like, this is what I see you need to improve on. You've got two narratives. You know, they have these, these back and forth discussions um, you know, every month. And so that, you know, really challenges people to, to do better. Um, yeah, that's amazing. Matt, um, are you there? What, Matt, what, what number are we at with working circles? How many working circles have we done at this point that we've numbered? We just surpassed mm-hmm. 730 working circles. Oh, gee, Manace, that's, you know, do the math. Um, well, each one's a half an hour. So, you know, 300 and whatever, 80 or so hours. Uh, of people sitting in these circles working on their narratives. It's it's such a good model and works so well at this point. Uh, Matt, how many times have we had major personality spats in any of these working circles and people yelling at each other, turning on each other, anybody having hurt feelings ever reporting back like this is a bad experience? Oh, yes, yes. That would be a big fat zero. That's, <laughs> that's what that would be. <laughs> I mean, it's really amazing. and. I think that the, the there's a reason for that, which is structure, 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 structure. And this is one thing I've learned along the way. If you want to factor out personality dynamics, structure is essential. That's the way you get rid of so much personality. And, you know, personality is great in the arts if you're trying to make a dramatic theatrical movie or something like that. But if you're trying to do analytical work and trying to work on somebody's project, things like that, um, it, it's just got to be all about devoid of uh, devoid of emotion too much and even largely devoid of humor. You know, those two things are great to be human. They're essential to be human. But in trying to do analytical work, you, you got to factor those things out. That's what happens with research papers. You know, you don't get to put humor and emotion into a research paper for a journal. Um, and it's the same sort of thing with crafting a narrative. And the way you do that is through this structure the structure in the working circles guarantees that everybody gets their chance to talk. You rotate around and everybody gets heard from. And as a result, you know, I can think of one instance in this entire course of one person trying to take things down with complaints about this is not being inclusive enough. And yet within that round were all sorts of people from other minority groups and none of them felt that and the person trying to lodge this complaint was not from any minority group um other than that one little moment of friction in almost 40 rounds of the course and 700 and some working circles uh, it's just worked very very smoothly and that's why it continues to be popular the thing that i i really enjoy is that we've never had any advertisements no journalists have written up anything about this training program uh, that frustrated me for a little while, but nowadays I'm just actually really happy with that. You know, let's just keep chugging along. And I think what I also really like is we've turned into a world of too much communication. I mean, that, especially the pandemic, just really drove it to the to the ceiling. There's too many podcasts. There's too many everythings, too many blogs, too many social media feeds. Everybody just screaming at everybody backwards and forwards. Um 
And I think in the middle of all of that storm of too much noise is just us keeping our nose to the grindstone, working with these people. When I think of the stuff we do at the World Bank and in particular, John Room and his ABT videos that he uses to communicate about what's going on with you know different site visits and things like that. It's just very gratifying to know that we're helping people on the ground do the work. Another pattern that's emerged now that's, that's worth mentioning, it's interesting, is that I, of course, came out of the environmental world and we began working with some environmental groups and with academic institutions. Uh, there seems to have been a, a process of selection that we've really diverged more and more off into um, public health as the major direction that we're going these days. And I think there's more urgency in public health. And as a result, there's more appreciation for the need for effective communication. And so much of the environmental world, I, I just don't feel the that they have the sense of urgency quite as much. So there's been some frustration there. But the the public health stuff is really um, enjoyable now, very gratifying. And in fact, especially what we're doing with in the medical world and the biomedical world and the work that we've done with uh, in particular with uh, not just the World Bank, but also GH Labs in Seattle. They are uh, kind of a, they're funded by the Gates Foundation and GH stands for Global Health. And they're basically an innovation workshop for developing new techniques and, and things like that for global health issue, mostly in low resource settings. So around the world in all these countries that have got limited resources and they go in and try and solve these problems of how do you do all these diagnostics for different diseases when you don't have all the wealth that you've got in a place like the US. Um, they're very fun to work with, but also this group at Emory University has been wonderful. The medical school and the two doctors that wrote the uh, forward to the book. And one of the real gems that's risen out of that effort was at the beginning of the year, I gave a talk in a seminar series that they have a monthly seminar. They asked me to give the talk about the ABT, what we're doing with the course. So I did that. And there's um, a nationwide organization called CTSE Consortium for Translational Science. What, what's CTSA stand for, Matt? Um, Clinical, oh, man. <laughs> I got it all wrong. It's, Clinical, translational. Uh, Clinical, translational, science alliance. I think that's it. Okay, something like that. Uh, it's basically all the medical schools all joined together. And so when I gave that talk, they ended up announcing it and it was on Zoom. They made it accessible to all the different medical schools. And one person who listened in was a fellow who's just finishing his last year of medical school at Harvard University Med School and had developed a deep interest in communication already. In fact, as a medical school student, among many activities, he put together um, a comedy, <laughs> a stand-up comedy series that he would do with the medical students that he's going to tell us about in a few minutes. So he got in touch with me, Navi Gafari, and we had one little chat in the spring, which we could tell we connected on a lot of the stuff. It was a pretty lengthy chat. Then he had to finish things up. And then about in August, he got back in touch and said he was now done and moving uh, back to California, where he's from, to Irvine, and wanted to know if there, we could do more stuff. Well, at that point, we began to get more serious and dig in deeper. And I, he showed up at just the right time for the book that we're, we were, I was writing on medicine version of the Narrative Gym. And so I invited him to start giving me notes on it. And then it dawned on me, we've got this kind of boilerplate structure for these, these books, which is seven main chapters. And the seventh chapter is where you explain specifics on where to apply the ABT framework into whatever discipline it is. And so he was the perfect guy to help me write that seventh chapter. And that's what we did when you get to this book. And in fact, I would encourage people, uh, get a copy of the book. We priced it as cheap as possible on Amazon. I think, is it $4.99, Matt? Uh, five ninety nine. Uh, four ninety nine. That's as cheap. Four ninety nine. Let us go. Really. That's it. Cheap as it can be. And we bought a whole bunch of copies. We've sent out to people and stacks of them just to get them out there. Um, it's so short and readable. The whole thing is one hundred forty pages. You can blow right through it. And most importantly, as I tell a lot of people now, just get the book and jump to chapter seven. Uh, read chapter seven because there's two parts to it. It begins with me kind of summarizing the model, everything I've gone through in the first six chapters. And then um, I hand it over to Navid. I say, now I've given you the general idea of this, this model, and especially these two main tools, the ABT and the Dobjansky. Now let me hand it over to a doctor who can uh, explain where in the medical profession these two tools um, are likely to be very helpful to you on a daily basis. 
And so on that note, Navid, how about if you join Julie and me, and we will continue this discussion now with you, our medical expert, who has lent your expertise to this book. And first off, give us your thought about this book. Awesome. Thank you, Randy. Great to be with you and great to be with you, Julie, as well. Um, it, it, it was, you know, as you said, awesome timing and especially with me wrapping up medical school and sort of really reflecting on my interests and really realizing that communication was a consistent theme amongst many of my interests. I wanted to get more involved and I remembered, you know, the amazing lecture that you gave that I just really resonated with and that sort of follow-up call. And so to get back in touch and see that there was an opportunity to learn more about the ABT and the Narrative Gym series and then to contribute sort of examples in medicine has been, uh, it's been a great ride and, you know, looking forward to continue to, you know, work with it. And as you were saying earlier in the podcast that, you know, with the team, even though it's been several months in, you're continuing to have even more granular and, you know, interesting conversations. And I feel like, you know, there's never enough time when we're on the phone to get get across the sort of points we want to get because it's just so much awesome content. Um, so maybe we need to start structuring our phone calls strictly in ABT to keep it, <laughs> it on time. Get to the therefore so we don't yeah. ramble on too much. Of, actually, that's a valid point. Um, let's have you tell us what happened, what happened with you and medical school? Why are you not now just starting your residency? That, that's a great question. I didn't realize this was the point of the podcast, but I'm, I'm always, I'm always ready for anything. Um, uh, it's, it, it's central to everything you have to say. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the crux of it was, I decided about a year before graduating that I would not do a residency. And what, what it really boiled down to is I, I just was reflecting on like, what are my my true interests? And how can I utilize those to ultimately still impact the health of others? And as I was really thinking about it, and realizing that what I really love to do is get in front of people and communicate a message of interest, ideally in a engaging and effective way. Um, and just thinking about these principles and how to apply it on a broad scale. I figured that I could still not only make an impact on individual patients, but have more of a broad reach. And just, there's so many, I feel like I ran into so many issues where just miscommunication was at the crux of so many problems, whether it was actual medical care or just miscommunication between colleagues and some person felt like it, they were, it rubbed them the wrong way. And with our current state of affairs of, you know, mental health in this country and burnout amongst physicians, it it was just tough to see that. And so I, I really wanted to try to dive more into that and, you know, try to see how can I, you know, figure out ways and then disseminate ways, you know, principally, I think the ABT as a solution to this, you know, really critical problem. So about two or three weeks ago, we had this amazing hour long discussion with a woman who does a, a video series and podcasts with uh, MedPage, where I've had five articles I've published through MedPage, and I came across her latest episode. And, and her name is Violin MD, because she was once upon a time going to be a concert violinist. She's Canadian. Um, and she gave up that career to go to medical school, became a doctor, and now makes these amazing... She's in Toronto, and um, her name is Chauvin um they showers and she is of irish descent uh and is basically just a tremendous communicator and i get asked by people all the time you know who's your example of a really good communicator I, she is the ultimate that i can point to when i look at her that's what happened was i listened to one of her episodes i actually looked at the transcript and instantly jumped out this is all abt oh my goodness whoever this is they're really really good and got in touch with her and then we ended up having this uh, hour-long discussion of which some of the very best parts of the discussion were when she and Navid began matching notes about medical school and, and medical training, all those kinds of things. And one of my favorite parts in there was that Navid had told me a few times that when he was in medical school, he organized uh, stand-up comedy uh, hour evenings or whatever for medical students. It didn't quite click with me as to why that would be funny, how that would work. Didn't really get it until it was the two of you, you and Siobhan talking about that. 
and talking about how deep into the weeds all you guys are in medical school. I love that one part when you were talking about how um, some of the guys didn't even think they were being funny and they got up there and just talked about things that they did and it turned out to be hilarious. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, the the sort of what what initially happened was that I I decided to just do an impromptu comedy show for my medical school and, and dental school friends. So there's about 40 or so people in the audience. And, and the structure was really I would just share individual stories from experiences I had on my clinical rotations. And what came out of that was there was a lot of shared experience and relatability. I mean, everyone in the audience knew me, so it was already a very warm crowd. And based off of the feedback afterwards of people saying, hey, you know, there was, I, I really resonated with this. It, it sort of prompted me to then start this, this comedy club and the structure for that, which is what you were alluding to, is that we would have every, you know, person, if they were so willing, just share one story you know, from a particular, we sort of had different themes. So like one story from your surgery rotation. And instead of saying, you know, tell us a funny story, which I think if you ask anyone that, you know, is sort of, we get pause and like, oh gosh, I got to be funny and sort of hard to be funny on the spot. What, what came to light was the, the, the power of the word absurd. And so we would say, tell us an absurd moment from this past two weeks on this rotation. And they would think about it. And you're like, doesn't have to be funny, just absurd. And they started to share. And it it was just absolutely hysterical. And I think the reason for it was it, you know, there was all these different types of delivery and 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 you know, people who are on the shire side where it was really just and 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 there really wasn't a lot of intonations. It didn't matter. It was such an inner circle group. It was all of us had gone through this experience. <laughs> It was, if anything, the worse the delivery was, the funnier it was because the content was just so good. And here was this person presenting it who otherwise would not get in front of a group of people and share. And it was funny. It was cathartic. It was meaningful. It And it really, that's something that I'm sort of taking, trying to take with me forward is just trying to tap into the power of, of, of the word absurd. Okay. Well, okay. Wait a second. Now here, I'm going to take over and analyze you and show you how good you are with communication, how deep your narrative intuition is because the power of storytelling rests in the specifics. That's the thing we hear over and over again. And about 10 years ago, um, a friend of mine named Maggie Carey, who is major veteran communications trainer, with uh, the Mayo Clinic and a bunch of other hospitals. And she told me about a standard exercise that she does with doctors. And it's very cool uh, exercise they do. What she does, she pairs them up and has them uh, tell the story to their the person they're paired up with of, I want you to tell us the story of the one moment in all of your medical experience where you felt all of your medical training coming together in a single moment. And the stories that come out are incredible. Almost all of them come from the emergency room. But, you know, people tell these stories about this guy came in, he had a bullet in his heart and they didn't teach us anything about that in medical school. But I knew this, I knew this, I knew this. And all of a sudden I told people this, 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 and it all came together. And some of those stories are just unbelievable. But what you begin to realize is why are they so good? Because it's about that one thing, the moment. The moment is the moment of specifics. You're getting into that super specific. And, you know, if you if you just told your people, Tell us some funny stories from medical school that that doesn't get you said, tell us the moment of absurdity that you knew somehow to you were basically doing the same exercise that this woman taught me about from the Mayo Clinic, which is have people get to that one moment. That is the essence of narrative structure when it's done well, is it all builds to that one moment. That's the essence of a great movie. You get to the climax of the movie where everything comes together and synthesizes right there. So I'm not surprised that that was really powerful. And effective, but uh, you know, that's part of why we started our conversations. I could tell from the outset you had really good narrative intuition, really knew what we were talking about with all of this. Um, so that's really fun. And right now you are working with um pharmaceutical company in iProduct. Um, what's the what's the specific topic? Yeah, so it's a it's a biopharma company called Tarsus Pharmaceuticals, and um they actually just got their first product FDA approved a few months ago and it is an eye drop that treats a eye condition called demodex blepharitis. And so it's the first and only approved treatment. And the first um, shipments just started a few months ago. And so it'll be really, it's a really exciting time for the company to go through this launch of 
first product, bringing on a whole sales force and becoming transforming into a commercial organization. And so uh, from a learning perspective, you know, this is a whole new world for me. And it's been fascinating to learn about just how a pharma company operates, how a sort of younger company operates. And and honestly, look, really trying to analyze, you know, what is what does the flow of information look like? What does it look like going up? What does it look like going down? What does it look like going You know, sideways? one thing that, that, that's fascinating is um, you met my next door neighbor, uh, Patrick, who's yes. German. And he's a laser physicist, like a really accomplished laser physicist. But he works nowadays um, in sales, basically, for a company that makes medical lasers. And mm -hmm. their equipment is so deeply sophisticated they have to have an expert like him to be able to go out to sell it to be able to explain to the hospitals here's the science of how these lasers work and all this sort of stuff it took me a while to understand you know that he's basically involved in sales but it's sales because he's got to communicate what the product does why it's so important why it's so valuable and everything like that which is the same thing i think you said you're, you're starting to talk with some of the people there at tarsus about that are involved in trying to get people to understand why this new product is i mean it, it's it, it all of this, you know, it circles back to is um Diana Padilla doing the the lecture in the course on proposal writing. And that all began in the very first round of the course when she, long-term buddy of mine, professor at university or at Sony Brook University, who's been a program officer with the National Science Foundation at times, and years and years of experience with proposals. She's also a great communicator. She did the Al Leopold training long ago. And she sat in that first session and heard Park Howell talking about the business world and basically salesmanship. And people have always kind of informally said, well, you know, proposal writing, it is salesmanship. You got to sell your idea to these people to fund it. But as she heard Park talk analytically and specifically about this stuff, she began to say that that's really articulating what you need to do for a, a proposal to work. And that was the beginning of her joining in the course. And she is now, we have now have four recurring lectures, lectures, she, Nancy Knowlton, Park Howell, and Brian Palermo, and they've all done over 30 round, or appearances in the course now, 30 times they've come back in these rounds, but it's all the same basic thing. And I think she would understand that just as well, is that as complicated as the science is, you still got to be out there selling it to people. And that's what you guys got to do now with this eye product is get them to understand the science. And yet the science alone doesn't quite do it it's got to be put into the context like that um that is rather amazing um julie what did you have for thoughts when you read this wonderful new book on the narrative gym for medicine well i had several thoughts but um, <laughs> um I mean, like the like the other narrative gym um books you know they're very readable very con conversational um very practical right you can use it right away but the one thing that really stood out for me is that, well, two things, um, that it, it we talked earlier about the evolution of the program, you know, of, of things that have brought in, um, you know, and, and happened over the last, you know, two years with, um, with your teaching the program. And so this really brings that all together to date, all the things that, you know, are, are um, you know, been brought into the program, the but because, if then, the but bomb, all those things. Um, and I really like that because it serves as a great reference, even for you know me that have been you know involved for a long time. But the thing that really hit me is how relatable the topic is. Um, all of us have experience with medicine and doctors and some form of miscommunication or poor communication. And you know it's so human centered and so personal. And, you know, the other ones, you know, I'm not in business, I'm not in politics. Um, and so why it's very interesting, and I can gain a lot from that. I didn't feel it kind of in my gut, like I did this one, because um, we well, have that's to great to hear. Wow, that, yeah. that's really excellent. And, you know, what's really good is, I, I love chapter seven, where I introduce, you know, I summar summarize the tools, and then I hand it over to Navid. And one of my ongoing themes more and more is partnerships. And especially these articles I've written in MedPage, I, I'm trying to save the biomedical world. Uh, you scientists are not going to solve this stuff by yourself. You've got to make partnerships, especially with the business world. They understand this broad communication stuff in a different way from you. And it's not that they're better than you or you're better than them. It's just two pieces of a puzzle that need to come together. And there's got to be the partnerships. And that didn't happen in the pandemic. 
and the Biden administration put together these advisory boards that were almost all MDs and PhDs and MPHs, and there was no presence of this practical side of communication. That's got to change eventually, or else they're just going to go down to crushing defeat. But that is, um, that's so much of the challenge is managing to, to pull those elements together. And it's really nice to hear you say that. And so then as I start that seventh chapter, I, I say it's time to practice what we're preaching here, which is I'm now going to bring in the medical expert to explain to you because I can't tell you exactly how to use this stuff in the medical world. And then the first thing Navid says when he steps in with his part is that um, in learning about the ABT, I realize I've, I've known this all along. I haven't known it analytically. I haven't been able, known the terms, but I know that this is what we do in communication in medicine if you do it right and it's present there. And going back to that that discussion with Chauvin, um, I love the one point where the two of you started talking. Suddenly, you both jumped into inner circle stuff on soap. And I did not know what the hell soap is. Um, and in fact, you tried to write it into that chapter and I chopped it out. I said, <laughs> no, you're getting into a little too much of the weeds, but it's really not that much of the weeds. But uh, tell us a few words about what does what this acronym SOAP mean? Sure. So SOAP is an acronym uh, that stands for Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan. And it really refers to sort of the clinical encounter. So the, the subjective is really the history, which has a number of its own breakdown of acronyms. And as a medical student, when you're first learning this, it's overwhelming, this all this information. And so it's a very helpful framework. And so what I was trying to get at with this is that we we learn a lot of frameworks in medicine, which is why I think something as beautifully simple as ABT could be so quickly adopted. Um, the O is objective, and that's really your vital signs, it's your physical exam and any data. And then your assessment and plan is really sort of the, the recap. And honestly, in that recap, which is referred to as the one liner, that is where we are really taught that like the words matter a lot. And, you know, they have this term, you know, pertinent positives and pertinent negatives, what should be in there. Um, and it reminds me of the ABT builds where, you know, Randy and Matt talk about, you know, you want to have enough specifics to, to have substance, but you don't have too many and, you know, make it, you know, just have a lot of noise. And so as a medical student, as you're going through crafting your one liner, we get a lot of feedback on, you know what, those two symptoms you mentioned in the list of five, they're not relevant. Okay. You got to realize that and don't include it. Or you tell the one liner, they say, you know, you missed to mention they have a fever. Like that is crucial. That's got to be in there. So that build that 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 process i feel like there's so many parallels of the one liner to abt where it's like medicine folks have learned this framework they've been working on it they're getting feedback and um so there's a lot of potential and then lastly the plan is where you go you know whether it's by organ system or by actual like medical problem of like you know high blood pressure diabetes and then you write specifically like for this problem we're doing x for this other problem we're doing y so a collectively a, a big framework with honestly small frameworks within it. And if we can learn that, then I'm pretty sure we can learn ABT, you know, in, yeah, in no well, time and, 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 and really go out end, and it, use it. It, it. Yeah, it's kind of the opposite in the end because um they they probably never talked about intuition that much um in what you were learning, right? Because that's that's the key thing is learn the stuff. Uh, at the point where you've got the intuition and the secret to that is to start off with simple things. And the ABT is the ultimate in simplicity. And it everything does break down to these three fundamental forces of agreement, contradiction, and consequence. And we know that going back hundreds of years to the early philosophers who first pinpointed it, it's just all been lost due to obfuscation over the past century. But the ABT is the primal element of all and everything else radiates outward from that. And every time people bring me, you know, some other model or framework or whatever, I look at it and go, that's nice. But, you know, at the core of it, you can see here's your basic ABT elements. This has just been made into more specialized, uh, derived a bit more, all which is great. But, um, yeah, it's if, if you can't get the intuition down, this there's no communication you can do a good job with by just reading from the rule book or something and you know try and plug in the blanks and and templates and that's what the abt brings is that elemental intuition and then also kind of the fractal dimension where you can structure things on, uh, onward from there so that is all very very interesting and i think all we wanted to do right now with this first episode coming back <clears throat> is get everybody 
introduced to the new book, we'll be getting out there and doing a bunch of things. I'll probably have you back in a few weeks, Navi, as we got the next round of things that are going on with it because we're just starting to plant some seeds and get copies of it out there. But I do feel this is the most practical one. And that's great what you said, Julie, about how it's it's so relatable because medicine is what we've all got our experiences with that. Um, I know in my little world, I have this group of friends at the dog park that every afternoon at four o'clock, I'm up there with my wonderful dog and we talk day in and day out and they're all a little older. They've all got medical issues. And I'm constantly listening to them, asking them, you know, what do you think makes a good doctor? And I'm not so good doctor when it comes to communication they've all got opinions on that so it it is it's part of our world uh medicine so yeehaw on that note um you got any final thoughts for us julie what do you got next that's going to be abt ish what you're doing uh right now we're working on media training so getting our our ambassadors to tighten their abts into a into a good story that the media will uh will cover so that's our, on our plate. Yep. That is great. Okie doke. All right. And Navid, you and I will be onward and upward. And that will do us for today. Um, we'll try and get back into the groove here with a few more episodes of the ABT podcast. And thank you all very much for listening and see you next time. Bye bye. And we're out. Wonderful. Um, hang on, let, let's can, can Naveed and Julie say some little final comment you can edit in there. So I will say, uh, and we'll see you all next time. And then you guys can say thanks very much or something like that. So we just hear your voices at the end. Okay, so um, let's do that. And um, we can go Julie first and then Naveed second. So okay. Uh, is that okay, Matt? That's fine. Okay. And on that note, we will see everybody next time here on the ABT Time Podcast. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Randy. And nice to meet you, Naveed. Thank you, Randy. Pleasure to be here and pleasure meeting you, Julie. All the best. Okay, no, thanks. See ya.